What's going on people? In this video, I'll be breaking down the first season of Jujutsu Kaisen in around 30 minutes or less, and by the end, you'll understand everything you need to know going into season 2. To make the timeline flow easier, one important detail I want to explain right from the beginning is the existence of Cursed Energy. In Jujutsu Kaisen, Cursed Energy is a mystical power source created from negative emotions, and for most people, their Cursed Energy just leaks out whenever they feel angry or upset. Over time, all this leaking cursed energy merges together in certain places to form invisible monsters known as cursed spirits. Although 99% of the population can't see them, these spirits kill thousands of people every single year, and the only ones who are trying to prevent this are the Jujutsu Sorcerers. For now, the two main things you should remember about Sorcerers is that they're actually able to see curses unlike everyone else, and they can harness their own cursed energy to activate superhuman abilities. With that explained, Season 1 of Jujutsu Kaisen starts off with Yuji Itadori, who's a freakishly strong high school student and member of the Occult Research Club. The aim of this small club is for students to theorize about paranormal activity, but in Yuji's case, there's a very personal reason why he joined. For nearly all of his life, he was raised by his granddad, Mr. Itadori, who's now currently in hospital on the verge of death. Because of that, Yuji wanted to join a club that required the least amount of commitment so that he'd have enough free time to visit the hospital after school. In episode 1, Yuji visits his granddad for the final time, and during their last conversation, it's implied that Mr. Itadori has no other friends or family who would want to be there. With his dying breaths, he basically warns his grandson not to end up alone like him, and he says that Yuji should use his strength to help people. Following that, Mr. Itadori quietly passes away, but it doesn't take long for a jujitsu sorcerer to then show up at the hospital. The name of this young sorcerer is Megami Fushiguro, and he was sent on a mission to find a dangerous object. For a bit of context here, a thousand years ago there was an evil sorcerer called Sukuna, who was arguably the greatest of all time, and when he died his soul was divided into 20 fingers. Each of these fingers contains a godly amount of cursed energy, and it just so happens that one of them was sealed inside a box at Yuji's school. Fushiguro's job was to retrieve that box before it began to hurt anyone, however by the time he arrived it had already been taken. This is what brings us back to the hospital, where Yuji confesses that it was him who found the cursed object, but since he didn't know what it was, he gave it to his friends in the occult research club. In doing so, he put their lives in serious danger, because at the school they were currently in the process of unsealing the finger. According to Fushiguro, this is the worst thing that could happen, as he reveals that if the seal is broken, cursed spirits will be attracted to the area and will likely kill Yuji's friends. It's why in this scene, the two of them rush to the school as fast as they can, and as Megami enters the building, he's confronted by a bunch of creepy looking curses. Luckily for him, he's able to fight most of them off by using his curse technique, and I'm just going to take a second to quickly explain what this is. A curse technique is a unique ability that a sorcerer has to be born with, and the nature of the technique will vary from person to person. For example, there's a technique that manipulates blood, a technique that turns sound waves into weapons, and when it comes to Fushiguro, his technique is called the Ten Shadows. The way it works is that there are 10 different hand gestures that he can make, each of which creates a shadow, and from those shadows he's able to summon up to 10 different Shikigami. In episode 1, he summons his divine dogs to tear apart the cursed spirits, but at this stage in the timeline there are several other Shikigami that he hasn't managed to control. Anyway, on the outside of the school, Yuji was told to wait here by Fushiguro, but after remembering what his granddad said about helping others, he decides to try and do something. Using his insane strength, Itadori jumps all the way up to the 4th floor of the school and manages to save his friends from being eaten by a curse. Prior to this moment, Yuji had never seen a cursed spirit in his life, but in near-death situations and in places with godly amounts of cursed energy, non-sorcerers like him are sometimes able to see them. As Itadori then picks up the cursed object, Fushiguro reveals that the reason spirits are attracted to Sukuna's finger is because swallowing all that cursed energy would make them more powerful. Seconds later, the group then gets attacked by the toughest curse so far, and during the chaos, it beats up Megami to the point where he can't really focus on his technique. At the same time, Yuji puts up a good fight, but as a non-sorcerer, it's impossible to kill spirits with his bare hands. That's why after it begins to overpower him, he decides that the best way to win is to swallow Sukuna's finger for himself. Based on what Fushiguro said, Yuji assumes that eating this will give him a ton of cursed energy, although what he doesn't know is that the finger is poisonous to humans. From the sidelines, Megami watches on in horror, fully expecting Itadori to die from this, but out of nowhere, Sukuna's ancient soul takes over his body. 
The anime described this as a one in a million outcome that isn't supposed to happen, and within seconds, Sukuna effortlessly wipes out the cursed spirit. Surprisingly though, despite him being the strongest cursed object of all time, Yuji's soul somehow manages to regain control. This is good news since it means that for now, Sukuna can't go on a rampage, but from Megami's perspective, it's still the worst day of his life. Thinking that Sukuna might still be in control, Fushiguro prepares to sacrifice himself by making the hand gesture to summon his most uncontrollable and overpowered Shikigami. Had he followed through with this, it's guaranteed that both himself and Yuji would have been killed, but fortunately for them, Gojo shows up before it happens. In the world of Jujutsu Sorcerers, Satoru Gojo is by far the most talented human alive and he also happens to be Megami's teacher. His limitless curse technique gives him the power to manipulate space itself and as a result he can teleport, erase matter, blow things away, make himself physically untouchable and he never runs out of curse energy due to his special eyes. Now, after arriving at Fushiguro's location, Gojo takes an interest in Yuji and his unique ability to suppress Sukuna's soul. A rare talent like this could be incredibly valuable, but sadly, according to Jujutsu regulations, anyone possessed by a curse object can't be allowed to survive. Regardless, Megami urges his teacher to find a way to save Yuji's life, and so the next day, Gojo brings Itadori to Jujutsu High. Hidden away in the mountains of Tokyo, Jujutsu High School is where generations of sorcerers have gone to master their techniques, including Gojo himself. The school is managed by a group of old men referred to as the higher-ups, and these guys are responsible for making the regulations. Unsurprisingly, once they found out about Yuji's situation, they ordered for him to be put to death, but Gojo made a convincing argument for delaying the execution. For the past 1000 years, nothing has ever been strong enough to destroy Tsukuna, but thanks to Itadori, they now have a real chance. Gojo's idea is that before Yuji gets executed, he should join Jujutsu High, where they can use him to track down all the remaining fingers. Once that's done, Yuji can then eat the rest of Sukuna's soul, so that when he gets executed, Sukuna will die at the same time. The higher-ups agree to this proposal since it's their best chance to finally defeat the King of Curses, while from Yuji's point of view, even though he doesn't want to get executed, he was fine with going along with the plan for two reasons. The first reason is that by eliminating Sukuna, fewer people will die from curses, and so in this way, Itadori is helping others just like his granddad wanted. The second reason is that because he's the only person who can do this job, he feels like he'd regret it if he just sat by and did nothing. After hearing this, the principal of Jujutsu High enrolls Yuji as a first year student alongside Fushiguro and one other person. Nobara Kugisaki is the feisty new student joining the class, and one thing you should know about her is that she's from the countryside and therefore isn't used to the kind of spirits that exist in Tokyo. This is why in episode 3, Gojo tries to test Nobara's skills by sending her and Yuji into a haunted building. Once they get inside, the two students then immediately split up, with Kugisaki being unimpressed at how Itadori only recently learnt about curses. Despite his inexperience though, he still exercises a spirit by himself by using this thing called a cursed tool. As the name suggests, cursed tools are weapons that have cursed energy flowing through them, and they can be used by literally anyone to exercise a curse. Meanwhile, on the top floor of the building, Nobara is put in a very tricky situation when a low-level spirit takes a child hostage. Generally speaking, highly populated areas like Tokyo generate more cursed energy than the countryside, and a knock-on effect of this is that the curses here are more intelligent. This curse was smart enough to recognize that it couldn't beat Kugasaki in a fight, and so instead it forces her to surrender by threatening the boy. In this moment, she accepts to herself that she's probably not going to make it, However, Itadori saves the day as he bursts through the wall. This gave Nobara an opening to exercise the cursed spirit, and in the aftermath, she opens up to Yuji about the reason she became a sorcerer. When she was younger, a family from Tokyo moved into her village, but were eventually forced to leave after receiving abuse from the locals. One of the girls in that family was Nobara's best friend at the time, and ever since the incident, Kugasaki has hated the countryside. Transferring to Jujutsu High was the only way for her to escape, and by arriving in Tokyo, she hopes that someday she'll bump into her old friend. Moving on, two weeks later, Nobara, Yuji, and Fushiguro are sent on a dangerous mission where unfortunately one of them ends up dead. To understand how this happened, we need to realize that when Sukuna came back to life, it led to a chain reaction in which his other 19 fingers were awakened. As a result, they now produce even more cursed energy than usual, and on this mission, the group encounters a spirit that consumed one of these supercharged fingers. 
Cursed spirits of this level would usually be dealt with by someone like Gojo, but on this occasion, he was away on business and apparently no one else was free. That's why the first years were handed such a dangerous job and after arriving at the scene, Nobra instantly gets abducted and thrown into a room full of cursed spirits. At the same time, Yuji and Fushiguro are attacked by the curse I just mentioned and they realise pretty quickly that they're outmatched. Yuji in particular has his arm chopped off right at the beginning of the fight while one of Fushiguro's divine dogs is torn to pieces. Feeling desperate, Isidori decides to ask Sukuna for help, but the King of Curses replies by threatening to murder everyone here if he gets control of the body. For that reason alone, Yuji begs his classmate to run as far away as possible so that he can unleash Sukuna without having to worry about people being killed. After briefly hesitating, Fushiguro agrees to this plan and he leaves the area to go and find Kugisaki. His remaining divine dog has the ability to track down anyone with a familiar scent and so in around 5 minutes, it leads them straight to Nobara. If they'd arrived any later, she would have definitely been eaten by this cursed spirit, but Fushiguro saves her life by using his frog Shikigami. Following that, they completely escape the area, with the unconscious Kugisaki being put in the back of a car and driven straight to the hospital. I should point out that Megami also had the option to go with her, but instead he chooses to stick around and wait for Yuji to come back. As he stands there waiting for a few minutes, Tsukuna suddenly appears out of nowhere having defeated the curse that was causing them so much trouble. Unlike the first episode though, this time around Yuji is struggling to regain control, giving Tsukuna a rare opportunity to just do whatever he wants. To start things off, he literally rips out Itadori's heart, meaning that if they were to switch places again, Yuji would immediately die. The second thing he does is increase his strength by eating another finger, and this finger is the one that he took from the curse he just destroyed. Finally, the third thing as you can see is that he regenerated Yuji's severed arm thanks to the power of reverse curse technique. Reverse curse technique is a rare skill that only the absolute 1% of sorcerers can do and it involves turning negative curse energy into positive energy that can heal the body. With all that said, Tsukuna proceeds to give Megami the worst beatdown of his life and even blows up one of his Shikigami in the process. As this one-sided fight continues, the King of Curses gets fascinated by Fushiguro's technique and claims that 10 shadows had the potential to beat the cursed spirit from earlier. In spite of that, Megami feels like this fight is one he can't win and so once again he prepares to sacrifice himself by summoning his most dangerous Shikigami. Just like in episode 1, his plan was for both himself and Tsukuna to die here but before he goes through with it, we learn a little bit more about his backstory. In the recent past, Fushiguro's sister fell into a deep coma and the incident helped him to understand that people get screwed over regardless of whether they're good or bad. Therefore, as a sorcerer, he tries to make sure that the good people suffer a tiny bit less, which is the reason he wanted to save Yuji. After hearing this, Itadori finally retakes control back from Tsukuna and collapses on the ground without the need for anyone to be sacrificed. The next day, when Gojo returns from his trip, he immediately suspects the higher-ups of organising Yuji's death. While it's true that they did agree to pause his execution, there were still many higher ups who wanted him gone, and sending first years on a mission like this was the perfect way to do it. In Gojo's mind, these elders are the scum of the jujitsu world, and his dream was to raise a new generation of students that could fundamentally change their society. Yuji was supposed to be a part of that dream, which is why he's so disappointed, but what Gojo didn't realise was that Itadori's soul wasn't fully gone. Inside the mind of every sorcerer, there's a place known as an innate domain and it's essentially a world that exists inside their head. When Yuji died, his soul entered Sukuna's innate domain, giving them one last chance to talk before he disappears. During this interaction, the King of Curses offers to heal Itadori's heart, but only if they agree to certain conditions. Condition number one is that at a time of Sukuna's choosing, he can take full control of Yuji's body for 60 seconds by saying the word extension. And condition number two is that Itadori will forget they made this deal. After negotiating, Sukuna agrees not to hurt anyone during those 60 seconds and so the two of them form a binding vow. In Jujutsu, a binding vow is a contract that literally can't be broken and it's implied the reason Sukuna wanted this deal is because he's plotting something to do with Fushiguro. Anyway, back in the real world, Yuji's body was seconds away from getting dissected by Shoko, who's the main doctor at Jujutsu High. However, as Gojo watches on, Itadori then resurrects in front of their eyes, creating a very interesting situation. As we know, the higher-ups all believe that Yuji is dead, so if they found out that he was alive then they might just try to target him again. This is why Gojo and Shoko agree to keep his resurrection a secret so that Itadori has time to train before anyone learns the truth. 
Later that same night, Yuji then gets taken to a random basement somewhere, where he begins learning how to control Curse Energy. Like I explained in the intro, Curse Energy comes from negative human emotions, but Jujutsu sorcerers are trained to use it regardless of their emotional state. In order for Yuji to learn this skill, he's forced to watch a ton of old movies, and the challenge here is to keep the negative energy flowing, irrespective of how the different movies make him feel. Now, while Itadori is busy with that, Gojo leaves to have a meeting with the principal, and on the journey there, he senses that he's being followed. After leaving the car, he's then ambushed by a special grade curse spirit, and I'm going to quickly break down what that means. In Jujutsu Kaisen, every curse is given a ranking, with grade 4 spirits being the weakest, and grade 1 spirits being the strongest. On rare occasions though, there are curse spirits so powerful that they rank even above grade 1, and it's these elites that are referred to as special grade. The name of this particular special grade is Jogo, and he's a super intelligent curse that's formed an alliance with other curses of the same level. Their ultimate goal is for curse spirits to become the dominant lifeforms on the planet, and to accomplish that mission, they need to get rid of the strongest sorcerer. What follows this is Jogo repeatedly trying and failing to land a hit, while Gojo crushes him in the most disrespectful way imaginable. During the middle of the fight, he even teleports away to grab Yuji, because he figured this would be a good chance to teach a student about domain expansions. A domain expansion is when someone uses massive amounts of cursed energy to bring their innate domain into the real world. The benefit is that your opponents will be trapped inside the barrier, and any attack you make against them is guaranteed to hit the target. For that reason, expanding his domain was Jogo's best chance of victory, but what he wasn't prepared for was Gojo doing the exact same thing. When two domains are activated in the same space, the more polished domain will nearly always override the other one, and in this case, Jogo loses instantly. Usually, this would be the part where he gets exercised as well, but Gojo decides to temporarily spare his life so that he can find out why the Kirsch ambushed him in the first place. To be specific, Gojo wants to know who the special grade is working with, and I guess now is a good time to explain the other members of Jogo's group. To start with, we have Hanami, who's an intelligent cursed spirit created from the fear that people have of the forest. Because of why he was born, his technique lets him generate flowers and other natural things that you'd expect to find in a forest environment. Next up, we have Dagon, who was created from the fear that people have of the ocean, hence why his domain expansion is this sunny beach. After him is Mahito, who's the leader of the group, and Mahito is a spirit born from the hatred that humans have towards each other. As a consequence, Mihito has a deep understanding of how people think, and his technique enables him to transform their soul in terrifying ways. Finally, the last member of this team is Suguru Gato, who's a human sorcerer and Gojo's former best friend. Back in their younger days, they were classmates together at Jujutsu High, and Season 2 will show us exactly what happened to their relationship. For now though, all you have to know is that everyone in the Jujutsu world thinks that Gato is dead, and they have no idea that he's secretly working with these cursed spirits. Switching back to Jogo's battle with Gojo, you'll notice that in the background, two of his allies have been watching him fight. Although neither of them wanted to get involved, Hanami decides that he can't just stand back and watch his fellow curse be destroyed. Therefore, he creates a big distraction using his technique, which gives Hanami a small opening to swoop in and save Jogo's life. This was a super risky move since there was always a chance that Gojo would have exercised them both, but luckily in this situation they do manage to escape. Following that encounter, the special grades realize that they don't have what it takes to kill the strongest sorcerer, which to be fair is something Ghetto tried to tell them from the beginning. Instead, his idea to deal with Gojo is to seal his former best friend inside the prison realm, which is a cursed object that traps its target in another dimension. For this scheme to work though, there are certain preparations that Ghetto has to make, which is why he says that they should wait a few months until October the 31st. Flashing forward to September, by this point Yuji has been secretly training for a while and he's learned the basics of using Curse Energy. To test out his new skills, Gojo sends him on a mission with Nanami, who's a grade 1 sorcerer and one of the few people that Gojo can trust. Together, their job is to investigate the murder of three high school students who were gruesomely disfigured in a local cinema. The way they were killed means that a cursed spirit is likely responsible, and after looking into it, Nanami discovers two things. Number one, at the time of the killings, there was another boy in the cinema called Junpei who could possibly be a witness. Number two, whoever the murderer is left behind obvious clues, almost like they want to be found. The next day, these clues bring Nanami to a location in the sewer, where he comes face to face with Mahito. Despite being the leader of his group, Mahito is a relatively young curse who spends his days experimenting on humans with his technique. 
Luring Nanami to the sewers was just another one of those experiments, as he wanted to transform the soul of a jujitsu sorcerer. What comes after this is one of the best fights in season 1 that ends in a draw, as Mahito is crushed under a pile of rubble, while Nanami escapes with a non-life threatening injury. At the exact same time, Yuji approaches Junpei to ask him a few questions, and it turns out the boy is able to see curses. Back in the cinema, he witnessed Mahito murdering his classmates, but rather than being scared, he wanted to know if he could learn the same power. In case you want to know why he's like this, Junpei is a character who was severely bullied at school, and the cinema victims were three of the bullies who made his life hell. Therefore, he didn't really care that they died, and after this incident, Mahito realized that Junpei could be useful to him. Remember, although the goal of Mahito's group is for curses to overthrow humanity, sealing Gojo was only one part of their plan. The second part is for Sukuna to join their side, and to make this happen, what they need is a human who can get close to Yuji. This is where Junpei comes in, because in episode 11, Mahito literally tells him to make friends with anyone wearing the Jujutsu High uniform. When Junpei then meets Itadori, this is exactly what happens, as they form a genuine connection over their love of movies. In fact, they get along so well that Yuji gets invited round to his house for dinner, while off in the distance, Geto is secretly observing the whole thing. Later that evening, it's implied that he talks to Mahito about what he saw, as they come up with a solid strategy to get Sukuna on their team. Without going into all the details, their plan was to engineer a situation in which Yuji would be forced to give permanent control of his body to the King of Curses. Mahito believed that by doing this favour for Sukuna, he'd be more likely to assist the group in their mission to become the dominant lifeforms. The very next day, this plan is then set into motion, as Junpei gets brutally disfigured right in front of Yuji's eyes. Naturally, Itadori doesn't have any powers to change his friend back to normal, and so he begs Sukuna for help and offers up his entire body in exchange for saving Junpei. Of course, this outcome is exactly what Mahito was hoping would happen, but in a shocking turn of events, the King of Curses chooses not to accept the deal. Part of the reason he says no is that he just enjoys seeing Yuji suffer, but another reason is that they already made a deal that will let him take over whenever he needs to. On top of that, it's unclear whether the reverse curse technique can cure someone whose soul has been manipulated, and so yeah, just overall it wasn't the best deal for Sukuna. As a result, Junpei drops dead right there and then, causing Yuji to lose his mind as he tries to get revenge against Mahito. Throughout his fight with the special grade, we learn that because Itadori has two souls inside him, it makes him naturally resistant to Mahito's technique. What this means is that his soul can't be destroyed in the same way as other people, and he can physically damage the curse in a way that Nanami wasn't able to. Speaking of Nanami, he then shows up at the location, and the two sorcerers work together to crush the special grade, to the point where he's about to be exorcised. Unfortunately though, this near-death experience causes Mahito to evolve, as he triggers his domain expansion for the first time ever. The main benefit of this barrier is that Mihito can destroy the soul of anyone trapped inside, and in this case he decides to only trap Nanami, since Yuji having two souls is a bit of a problem. Being realistic, this was actually the smartest thing Mihito could have done, but what he wasn't prepared for was that Itadori would be crazy enough to break into his domain. Breaking into this barrier from the outside is a thing that no sane person would ever think about, but by Yuji doing this, it meant that Mahito's domain accidentally made contact with Sukuna's soul. The King of Curses is someone with huge amounts of pride, and having his soul touched in this way is something that he didn't really appreciate. Also, he genuinely doesn't care about anyone else except himself and Megami, and so for that reason, Sukuna blows up Mahito's domain. The fight is then basically over after that, as the special grade runs away into the sewers, while the sorcerers try and fail to chase after him. Anyway, moving back to Jujutsu High, for the past month, Megumi and Kugisaki had been training for the Goodwill event. Once a year, students from Tokyo Jujutsu High face off against students from Kyoto Jujutsu High in what's supposed to be a friendly competition. On both sides, you have quite a few interesting students, but for the purpose of this video, I'm just going to take you through the five characters who will be most relevant to the plot. First off, in the Tokyo school, we have Maki Zenin, who's a second year student and member of the Zenin bloodline. In the world of Jujutsu, the Zenin clan are one of the most influential families, alongside the Gojo clan and the Kamo clan. However, Maki is basically treated by everyone in her family as a failure since she was born with a rare condition known as Heavenly Restriction. Heavenly Restriction is when a sorcerer is born with a defect in exchange for being extremely talented in some other way. When it comes to Maki, she was born without a single drop of cursed energy which is even less than the average person. 
but in exchange, she has superhuman strength on a similar level to Yuji. Panda is another second year student at Tokyo, and he's a rare type of creature referred to as a cursed corpse. To put it simply, a cursed corpse is an inanimate object that is brought to life when someone puts cursed energy inside it. Most of the time, these corpses are only able to function as long as they keep receiving cursed energy, but Panda is different from this since he's able to generate his own cursed energy like a regular human. As a brief side note, Panda was the creation of Principal Yaga, who's the guy that runs Tokyo Jujutsu High. Switching over to the Kyoto school, we have Mai Zenin, who's the twin sister of Maki, and someone who never wanted to be a sorcerer. It was only when Maki joined Jujutsu High that Mai was pressured to go down a similar path, and as you can imagine, they don't really get along. One of Mai's classmates at Kyoto is a robot called Mekamaru, but in reality, the robot is controlled by a real person. Just like Maki, this guy was born with heavenly restriction, meaning that in exchange for being heavily disabled, he has massive amounts of cursed energy and a long-range technique that lets him control puppets. Finally, the last person I want to mention for now is Todo, who is by far the strongest student at Kyoto, and he's an interesting guy who loves to fight, hates boring people, doesn't listen to instructions, is obsessed with a pop star, and thinks of himself as extremely intelligent. On the day of the Goodwill event, he and his classmates travel to Tokyo to take part in a team battle against Fushiguro's group. However, just before it gets underway, Gojo turns up with a surprise for everyone as he dramatically reveals that Yuji is still alive. Given that it's been about two months since he died, Megami and Kugisaki had finished grieving him a long time ago, and so their initial reaction wasn't as excited as he was expecting. Regardless, they were both happy to have him back, although there's one person who didn't exactly feel the same way. Principal Gakuganji is the headmaster of the Kyoto school and is one of the old higher-ups that wanted Yuji to be executed. After finding out that Sukuna's vessel isn't dead, Gakuganji holds an emergency meeting with his students where he orders them to kill Itadori for a second time. In particular, he wants the killing to take place during the Goodwill event in a way that makes it look like an accident. Meanwhile, as if that wasn't enough drama, in a separate area of the school, Mahito had managed to sneak in. To understand why, we need to flash back to the moment when Sukuna casually destroyed his domain expansion. It was thanks to this humiliation that Mahito realized the King of Curses is way stronger than he ever imagined. In fact, Sukuna's strength was so overwhelming that the cursed spirits don't even want him to join their team anymore. Instead, all they want is to bring him back to life as they believe that he'll begin a new era of curses all by himself. This is where Jujutsu High comes in, because hidden somewhere inside the school are six of Sukuna's fingers. So far in the series, Yuji has ever only consumed one finger at a time, which has enabled him to retain some level of control. However, things would be different if he was forced to eat six or more in one go. That's why Gato suggested that they steal them from Jujutsu High, so that on October the 31st, they'll be able to unleash Sukuna and seal Gojo on the same day. Now, one thing I should probably mention before we continue is that inside the school, there's a 1,000 year old sorcerer who protects the cursed objects. The name of this sorcerer is Tengen, and for now, all you need to know about this character is that she is the only one who knows where Sukuna's fingers are stored. Normally, it would be impossible for anyone else to find them, but luckily, Gato had thought of a way around this. During the Junpei storyline, Gato actually had a finger of his own, and he strategically planted it somewhere where he knew Jujutsu Hai would find it. As expected, the school then took the cursed object and placed it with the others, but what they didn't know is that it had a tracker with Mihito's cursed energy inside it. This meant that Mihito would easily be able to find the secret room, and while he's doing that, Hanami and a couple of assassins will create a big distraction. Back to the Goodwill event, by this point in the team battle, Kugasaki was defeated by Mai, Mai was then defeated by Maki, Mikamaru was defeated by Panda, and Yuji and Toto somehow became best friends. Unlike the rest of his school, Toto didn't have any desire to kill Itadori, and as the two of them started fighting, he realized that they liked the same type of girl. As a result, he protected his new best friend from being executed, and begins teaching Yuji a lesson about how to harness cursed energy more efficiently. While that craziness was going on, Megami was involved in a fight of his own against a student who has a lot of political importance. Norotoshi Kamo is a third year student at Kyoto High, and next in line to be leader of the Kamo clan. I mentioned earlier that the Kamo clan is equal to the Gojo clan and the Zenin clan, meaning Norotoshi himself is a future higher up of the Jujutsu world. Despite that, he has a super complicated family situation, which is why he feels like he can relate to Fushiguro. 
11 years ago, Fushiguro's dad disappeared without a trace and Gojo stepped in to essentially become his new legal guardian. What makes this complicated is that Megami's father was from the Zenin clan, meaning that Fushiguro is a sorcerer with Zenin blood but who's more closely associated with the Gojos. Anyway, during his fight with Noritoshi, things get interrupted when Hanami shows up. The special grade attacks them so badly that Megami thinks about sacrificing himself for the third time, but he chooses not to when some other Tokyo students come to help. Gradually, the battle keeps evolving until Yuji and Toto were the main ones fighting Hanami and they're able to deal a good amount of damage. Toto's curse technique lets him switch places with anything that has a certain amount of curse energy and so he constantly confuses the special grade by changing positions. At the same time, Yuji is now a lot stronger thanks to his new best friend and he punches Hanami with an attack known as Black Flash. Black Flash is a rare thing that happens when sorcerers are fully in tune with their curse energy and it increases the strength of their attacks by more than double. Together, Yuji and Toto force Hanami into a desperate situation where he felt like his best option to survive was to activate his domain expansion. However, before he gets the chance to activate it, Satoru Gojo finally makes an appearance. Up until this moment, he'd been unable to join the fight because the villains had made a barrier out of curse energy that specifically prevented him from coming in. Barriers like this are referred to as curtains, and the rules of a curtain will vary depending on who created it. In this case, the only rule of this barrier was that Gojo wasn't allowed to enter, but everyone else was free to come in or out whenever they wanted. This was a genius move because it meant that Satura focused all his energy on getting inside, rather than paying attention to the fact that the school was getting robbed. Regardless, he kind of saves the day by crippling one of the assassins and blowing a huge trunk out of the forest that was supposed to kill Hanami. Honestly, the damage here was so extensive that nobody could really tell whether the spirit was dead or alive, but later that day we find out that the special grade did barely manage to escape. Following this incident, the goodwill event is on the verge of being cancelled, but Toto manages to persuade the other students to continue. That's why the next day, the two schools have a baseball match to determine the winner, with Yuji helping Tokyo in a big way to come out on top. Although the higher-ups do still want him dead, Principal Yaga convinces Principal Gakuganji to hold off for now, as Itadori proved that he has the potential to save lives in the future. Later that week, the first years are sent on a brand new mission where they investigate the mysterious deaths of four people. The four victims all used to be classmates over 20 years ago, and coincidentally, the school they went to is where Megami used to go before Jujutsu High. As part of the investigation, Fushiguro pays his old school a visit, where a member of staff and a couple other students give us some relevant information. Near the local area, there's a famous haunted place called Yasohachi Bridge, and 20 years ago, four students were found unconscious in this exact spot. When the kids woke up, they had no recollection of what happened, but now, in the present day, all four were recently murdered by a cursed spirit. The main question for Jujutsu High is whether the cursed spirit will target anyone else next, and this is where Fujinuma comes in. Fujinuma is one of Megami's old classmates, and she reveals that during her childhood she visited Yasuhachi Bridge along with Fushiguro's sister. What this means is that based on all the evidence so far, the curse that killed those four men will likely go after Fujinuma and Sumiki within the next one or two weeks. Therefore, in order to save their lives, it's important that this spirit is exercised as soon as humanly possible, which is why the first years arrive at the bridge. Pretty soon, the three of them then walk into a barrier made of cursed energy, and once inside, they get confronted by a creature they've never faced before. For a bit of context here, 150 years ago, there was an evil sorcerer called Noritoshi Kamo, who was the ancestor of the Noritoshi in the present day. The old Noritoshi was infamous for his disgusting experiments, one of which was to create a life form that was both half human and half cursed spirit. In total, he made nine of these hybrids, and the official name for them is the Curse Womb Death Paintings. For decades, all nine death paintings were hidden inside Jujutsu High, in the same storeroom as Sukuna's fingers. When Mihito robbed the school, he took three of the death paintings with him, and with Gato's help, Chozo, Ezo, and Kijisu were brought back to life in new bodies. Despite them being hybrids, the three brothers feel no loyalty towards humans or cursed spirits, as the only thing they care about is protecting each other. For that reason, they do agree to help Mahito because the world he's trying to create is one where the death paintings might be able to live in peace. Following that, Eiso and Kijisu were set on a mission to find one of Sukuna's missing fingers, which just so happens to be under Yasohachi Bridge. This is what leads to a fight between the death paintings and Yujisaki, while Megami is left to fight against the curse that they came here to kill. 
A long time ago, this cursed spirit had absorbed one of Sukuna's fingers, but for a while nothing happened because the fingers weren't awakened. However, once Sukuna was reincarnated a few months ago, all the fingers woke up and the curse of Yasuhachi Bridge then became active. This means that the recent death of those four adults and the upcoming death of Sumiki, it can all be traced back to Yuji's decision to eat the cursed object. Anyway, it goes without saying that the cursed spirit of Yasuhachi Bridge was incredibly strong, even more so than the one they faced earlier in the series. Within seconds, it almost instantly knocks Bushiguro unconscious and puts him in a situation where he doesn't have much hope of survival. That's why, for the fourth time this season, he gets ready to sacrifice himself by summoning a Shikigami that he knows will kill them both. Before he fully summons it though, he remembers something that was said to him by two of the strongest sorcerers of all time. As we know, Sukuna outright stated that Megami has the potential to beat curses like this, while Gojo encouraged his student to abandon this sacrificial mentality that keeps holding him back. Therefore, instead of just sacrificing himself, Fushiguro chooses to go all out as he attempts to manifest his domain in the real world. Only sorcerers of the highest level can do this, and while Megami isn't on that level yet, he's able to create an incomplete domain expansion. Within this shadowy domain, he can create clones of himself and clones of his Shikigami, which are used to overwhelm the special great spirit. He then finishes it off by activating his divine dog, which brutally rips out Sukuna's finger from inside the spirit's chest. In the end, the result of this fight is that Sumiki and Fujinuma are no longer going to die from the curse of the bridge, but unfortunately his sister is still in a coma due to a completely separate curse that she also has. Meanwhile, Yuji and Kugisaki kill the two death paintings, and this was impressive since Eizo and his brother were technically special grade curses. After the incident, Itadori feels slightly guilty for what happened, given that they ended the lives of two actual human beings who clearly cared about each other a lot. Although the eldest sibling Chozo wasn't there, his curse technique allowed him to sense that his siblings were killed. Geto then reveals to him that it was Yuji who killed them, and this scene is super important for two reasons. Number one, Geto receiving this intel so quickly proves beyond any doubt that there's someone at Jujutsu High who's feeding him information. Number two, the death of Chozo's brothers gives him a real motivation to go after Yuji, which should be explored in the next season. A few days later, word begins to spread about how the first years each defeated a special grade, and this leads to a couple different consequences. For a start, Toto makes an official recommendation that they be promoted to grade one sorcerers, and his recommendation is supported by one of Gojo's friends, who may or may not have been paid by Gojo to do this. Another thing is that the second years begin training even harder than before, since Maki is determined not to fall behind her cousin Fushiguro and the other two first year students. On top of that, although the recent deaths were kind of Itadori's fault, Megami and Nobara agree not to tell him since they think that he might not be able to deal with the guilt. That being said, an interesting plot twist is that Yuji does actually know it was his fault, but he chooses not to say anything because he doesn't want Fushiguro to feel regret for saving his life. Season 1 then comes to an end with the first years going shopping before Gojo unexpectedly calls them for what he describes as a top secret mission. With that said, that was the whole of JJK Season 1 Explained in around 30 minutes, although I think this might end up actually being closer to 40. If you enjoyed this video, then I'd really appreciate if you subscribe so you don't miss out on future content like this, and hit that like button as it does help out with the algorithm. Until the next one, peace out.